continue to invest in next generation system to better manage our operating costs in such area as yield management, which is EBIT focus, shipboard and landside operation, which is really more dealing with cross-functional management execution capabilities, and network planning. And all these fu three functions actually is heavily depending on IT, IT capability and efficiency. The, advance, the advancement in this technology provided us the competitive edge and ability to differentiate our products and services in the market. Apart from the large ships and supporting IT system, another key part to the success of a focused scale strategy is finding the like-minded partners to collaborate and achieve cost efficiency with, while at the same time improving network coverage and service frequency for customers. The formation of alliances through vessel sharing agreements was not a new phenomenon. In fact, strategic alliances arrangements were around since the 1970s, a tool that industry has been using for many years. And this is the chart of the current alignment, uh, alliance structure. Alliance allowed, in fact, medium and small size carriers to offer similar service products, frequencies, and vessel cost efficiency as the largest players. Today, even the biggest player in the industry have also come together to form alliances of their own to further drive down unit costs by better utilizing their resources and spreading the risk of investment and capacity. And you will see 2M is Maersk and MSC being number one and number two carrier in, uh, in the industry. Moving forward with the ever greater need to drive costs down and find smarter way to do business, we must dig deeper into our operation and look into most granular level of things to examine so that no stone are left unturned at all the major cost centers, particularly those related to shipboard efficiency, shoreside productivity at terminals, landside transportation such as container positioning, as well as BNA cost management. Given the regulated nature of container shipping industry, that also shapes our business model. We are essentially operating within a particular set of regulatory framework and boundaries that may limit our reach to explore new areas that can potentially provide further efficiency in our operations. Faced with the rapidly changing market landscape, we may need to look beyond our industry parameters or the usual tools thinking outside of the box, so to speak. Let's take a moment to think, for example, what if the scope of a carrier alliance can be expanded into other areas beyond the ocean-going realms? From a simple business perspective, if the players along the supply chain can join hand and work together, further improvement of cost and operational efficiency can be realized. With the regulator, re, regulator's blessing, Carries Alliance can explore the expansion of their existing cooperation's scope into different areas, such as land operations, or coming together on terminal projects, pooling multiple and similar cost centers, which might eliminate many overlapping and therefore unnecessary expenditures. Taking alliance structure a step further by, allying, by allowing carriers to come closer together to improve on overall efficiency would enable 
the coexistence of carriers of all sizes, big and small, including those by themselves do not have the scale advantage and financial portfolio to compete in such a capital intensive industry. And for allowing tighter knit cooperation arrangement between carriers can help take the utilization of resource, cost saving, and performance to a higher level, ultimately benefiting all consumers. Such a cooperative structure, structure makes good business sense to all the players involved. And more importantly, it also helps preserve competition in the industry as a whole. However far we may throw these ideas to push our industry to new boundaries, and however much we tinker around with the tools of our theater of play to drive costs down and achieve profitability, the constant changing dynamics of the industry is one that is still largely driven and shaped by the forces of consumer demand in the world economy. The protracted period of the low GDP growth for more than half a decade in the low interest rate environment reflects the low consumption levels. And with low demand growth, many of us in the industry have been struggling to keep revenue up. While the lack of demand growth of the low, while the lack of demand growth and low inflationary economies are at play, the cost to recovery has been complicated by other important variables, such as geopolitics, world conflicts, sanctions, non-tariff barriers, and related protectionist measures that have been hindering trade at a time when the industry needs it most. Since the last Doha round, no significant progress or breakthrough have been made to further advance trade negotiation among the WTO members. Despite the lack of momentum from Doha, we have seen countries still entering into dialogues and forming trade pacts, such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership Group of Asia-Pacific Nations and the ASEAN economies coming together with similar agenda and objective to stimulate trade and encourage investment. But, one of, but the one that has been gathering a lot of attention and making headlines lately is China's role of developing this new Silk Road, or the One Belt, One Road Initiative, to improve connect connection over land and sea among China, Middle East, Asia, Africa, and European countries through massive investment projects in infrastructures, building roads, airports, railroads, and maritime ports. The ultimate objective would be creating new pockets of sustain, sustainable demand within a region that consists of 60 nations with a population of more than 4 billion and an economy today of about 21 trillion. Given the problem of lackluster global demand growth we face today, one of the most logical prescription of the economist and policymaker is to stimulate the market by investment in infrastructure that not only can help boost fixed asset investment in the short term, but also create demand growth in the long term. With China's own economic development experience over the last 35 years, based on infrastructure and connectivity, it is uniquely qualified to help initiate this ambition endeavor with many Asian economies and other nations joining hand to create and sponsor the Asian 
Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, and BRICS Bank. This endeavor will help elevate the economic activities in this vast region, creating the much needed new impetus to global economic growth. To make the new Silk Road work and reach its full potential, close cooperation among world nations is very important. And it is not surprising that Chinese officials have been quite consistent in this message. The new Silk Road initiative is no small feat. It takes determination and cooperation among all nations in this vast geography to make it a success. While all the pieces coming together, the initiative may well bring new energy and stronger partnership to all those who have joined hands in the effort to improve our world economy. Based on China's infrastructure's induced growth experience, my wish is to see the same effect happening in all emerging economies touched by the new Silk Road. As construction pick up steam and new infrastructure would attract more private sector investments to grow their economies, and as wealth builds up, new markets and demand for trade should rise accordingly and become the new driver for economic growth for decades to come. Ladies and gentlemen, in our industry's years of progress in trade and globalization, the word cooperation seems to be really hitting home as the common denominator in our discussion today. May it be strengthening cooperation in the context of shipping alliance, in improving scale efficiency, finding new cooperation area to achieve further efficiency in our operations, or government working together to formulate policy that boosts trade ties and stimulate demand growth through closer cooperation. It is becoming an increasing necessity in the global village that we have built. And as villager, we must focus more of our effort to cultivating for success. Now, on this note, I wish to thank MPA again for bringing our peers and colleagues together for this lecture and supporting the Singapore Maritime Week where our discussion and dialogues are important to sharing new ideas and exploring new cooperation opportunities. With this, I look forward to you all in our following Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tong. Please kindly join Mr. Soman Pao on stage for the dialogue session. Ladies and gentlemen, should you have a question for Mr. Tong during the dialogue session, kindly raise your hand and one of our ushers will hand the microphone to you. Now please identify yourself and your organization before posing the question. Mr. Soman Pao, please. Thank you, Mr. Tung, for a great tour of the um, container shipping industry from your vantage point, starting with global slowdown, uh, the container trade growth slowing. Uh, you mentioned the business model has not changed that much. Um, effective operating systems are still critical, but needing to look beyond normal industry parameters, whether that's in alliances or customers, whether it's in geopolitics or the new Silk Road. So we've got a lot of uh, ground that we can cover. And now we get to probe deeper into your insights and secrets. And what I would suggest, since there are probably plenty of questions from all of you um, on, on the floor, that we try to maybe start with questions about macro, because this is really what underpins container industry dynamics going forwards. And then maybe we can take um, a group of questions about the container industry specifically. Um, and then any other topics like the environment, uh, technology, legislation, or more personal insights. You're free to ask questions anytime they come to mind and you have a burning question. 
but it might be good if we can start, if you have any questions on, uh, on the macro uh, global environment. Hi. Um, you know, I, I'm really amazed that this Maritime Week has brought us together. And uh, my name is Annie Cole. I'm the Vice President at Singapore Management University. And my main question right now is 25 years of shipping and with a lot of disruptions happening in many other industry, I'm interested to know, Mr. Tung, what would be the big disruption that you see in the maritime industry, especially shipping? Uh, uh, I would say the biggest sort of disruption, and by the way, disruption is not a bad word today because, you know, disruptive industry usually you know, breaks through to become something quite, you know, the novel. Uh, the biggest dis disruption that we have is undoubtedly the, uh, the giant step up of the size of vessel that we have recently seen. You know, the triple uh, E class vessel that MERS took the leadership of ordering uh, before the uh, onset of the uh, financial crisis and as I described it earlier, that actually brought about uh, tremendous uh, cost reduction uh, on the uh, what we call slot costs, uh, or rather unit costs. And particularly, of course, this is enhanced because the high oil price that we have seen. You know, the advantage may be slightly watered down because of the reduction of oil price. But having said that, I think we gradually realize that the big advantage those big unit of ships can actually produce, then you know everybody wants to compete or remain competitive in the market today must almost have to have the same type of you know, the uh, size of vessel in their operation. Can I ask a, a question on size? You, you took us back to the, the early days of, of shipping. Can you take us back further just to get a perspective on how far we've come and maybe how far we can go? Can you tell us a bit about your first ship and then extrapolate that into the future? What are the limits in terms of size? It's not surprising I had lunch with Andrea today and we were talking about the size of ship and I recall to him that our very first venture in container shipping uh, was 1969. And at that time, we have acquired three war-built victory ships. War-built meaning was built in 1943 or 44. And that's already 1969. So the ship, by the time we utilize, is already 25 years old. And we converted that into a container ship by re removing everything on deck, putting drilling mud as ballast because the ship will be very light floating. And the capacity of that ship is 300 units, 300 TEU. And the funnier, even more funny, or rather not funny, the first sailing we left Hong Kong to go to Los Angeles, we carry 26 TEU. So that's where we come from. So then if we look into the future, we've seen uh, 60, 70 times increase in the space of 45 years. Uh, clearly, we can't just keep drawing a line along that. But how much further can we go? 20,000, is that uh, a limit? Or can we see 30, 40, 50? What, what's the limit here? Well, I think you know the big ship, of course, is very efficient. But you need to have the capacity to fill them. So if you go back to the 1960s, we have probably more than 100 companies that's participating in the trade. Today, I think container shipping, probably meaningfully you can count about 20. So that's the difference in terms of number of player and therefore the capacity each player had actually built up you know, in order to fill the ship. And with a bigger ship, the smaller guys need to form together and share the uh, asset so that in a big ship, if you have six in an alliance, then each would roughly take one six. 
So for a 20,000 or 18,000 TU size ship, in an alliance of six, each will be responsible by about basically 3,000 units. So it's not all that bad, you know, and yet you are able to share the cost benefit of a huge 18,000 TU size ship, yeah. And just one more question on size, and then uh, please raise your hand if you have questions in the floor. But just one more from me on this. I, I, it feels like an arms race in uh, container shipping. You've explained why there's a cost advantage to having bigger ships. It becomes a competitive necessity. But everybody's just killing each other by ordering more and more of these big ships. So how, how does one get out of this arms race or treadmill that just leads to collective doom? Well, the short answer is no, you can't get out of this uh, arms race because it's the nature of our business. Uh, it is a free market and everybody that can find finance are free to build as many ships as they wish. Yeah. So in the sense that, as I try to describe, that this excess capacity is here. It's a permanent problem. But with the industry that's growing healthily, then we anticipate the future to take care of that excess. And then suddenly 2008, financial crisis come and suddenly demand disappeared or with a very low growth. Then we have this issue of exacerbated excess capacity. Yeah. So, you know, but on the other hand, if you try to make profit out of it, then again, refer to what I